All right. Welcome everyone to day four of DC Startup Week. Um, my name is Amira El Gawli. I am the founder and CEO of Manifesta, a workplace culture agency here in the district. Um, we're a proud sponsor as well as the curator of um, the inaugural culture track here at DC Startup Week. Um, we're gonna just take a moment and thank our sponsors. Um, our title sponsors are Next, Insperity, WIS, and Technology Rivers. Thank you so much for your support. Um, for everyone who's joined us, if you have questions throughout, and I imagine you'll have lots of questions for our amazing panelists, um, just put in all caps the word question so that we can detect it in what we hope will be a really lively chat. And I'll keep track of those throughout the session. Um, so really quickly, before we jump into introducing our amazing panel, I just wanted to share with you that if you haven't been to any other culture track sessions, but are really interested in um, learning more about our speakers, uh, getting a full recap of, the, of every single session, go ahead and go to manifesta.co slash startup week. You can download the, the full guide to the culture track, nine amazing sessions, and you'll automatically receive the, um, the recap next week, which is going to also have incredible recommendations provided to us by every single speaker, 25 amazing people who, who gave us their book recommendations, their podcast recommendations, all sorts of great resources for you to use beyond this week. So thank you all for being here. Um, I am now going to introduce um, these four badass women who are here to school us on what they've been learning about remote work in this time. Um, we, we, we incorporated this topic because so many of us, I, I want to say the majority of us, even though there are people who are working in many different kinds of environments right now, some people who aren't able to work remotely. So I do want to respect that. For, but for the many of us who are working remotely, we have had to grapple with and experiment with different ways of engaging our teams and figuring out policies. And so um, I am, I'm so pleased to introduce to you um, these four amazing women who are here to share with us their ideas, tactics, lessons learned about remote work, um, what the future of it looks like. So starting with uh, Tiffany Deans. Tiffany um, runs her own consultancy. She's the CEO and Managing Director of Harco Solutions. Um, her outlook is simple. She just wants the world of work to be the best it can be. Uh, and for the last 17 years, she has dedicated her professional and personal time to HR uh, to make that a progressive reality. To sum it all up, she's obsessed with all things HR. Welcome, Tiffany. We're so happy to have you with us. Um, next up, I'm so excited to introduce Corinne Perry. Corinne is the Chief of Staff and Interim CEO at SeedSpot, a nonprofit that increases venture success for impact-driven entrepreneurs. Recently, uh, Corinne completed a certificate in the science of happiness at work, which sounds amazing. She highly recommends it to you. Um, she managed a bi-coastal team remotely for four years and has worked remotely since 2016. So she's, she got a head start uh, for, for all, from all of us. Um, she's passionate about creating stellar processes to help teams stay on track, um, working towards meaningful outcomes. Um, Third up, we have Olivia, Olivia um, Rogine. I should have asked you how to pronounce your last name. That was actually pretty good, Rogine. Yeah, I'm impressed. <laughs> okay, not bad. Okay, Olivia is the director of community at Girls Night In, um, a company and community reimagining how we take care. Girls Night In was built on the belief that as our lives get busier, the more important it is to slow down and unwind. Olivia leads GNI's newest project, The Lounge, a community membership platform for making deep and meaningful connections. 
The Lounge is building the future of distance and virtual community care with a nationwide network of community leaders and members whom Olivia manages. Olivia, thank you so much for being with us. And last, but absolutely not least, is our wonderful moderator, Jacqueline Baker. Thank you, Jacqueline, for uh, generously leading the effort here. We're so happy to have you. Um, Jacqueline is the director of startup program, sorry, wow, the vice president of startup programming um, for AARP Innovation Labs, which has been actually a key part of DC Startup Week. So not just the section, session, they've been involved in other sessions as has SeedSpot. So thank you so much, Jacqueline, for being with us. Um, I will let you take it from here, share more about who you are and what you do at AARP Innovation Labs. Um, so excited to have you lead this conversation. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you for being a leader in making sure that this um, particular engagement came to life. You've been a wonderful guide throughout the process. And so first of all, we thank you. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to this dynamic conversation with um, all of our panelists. I'll share just a little bit about AARP Innovation Labs. Um, I hope that some of you had the opportunity to uh, pop into some of the other conversations that we had earlier today. We were back to back to back with conversations um, by some leaders, leaders over at AARP Innovation Labs. I really wish that the world was open because last year we ended DC Startup Week over at the Hatchery, which is our 10,000 square foot innovation lab in the heart of Washington, DC. Some of you, I remember because we had some end of day cocktails and some pitches. And so I remember some of your faces there. But it was a good time. Um, and um, at AARP Innovation Labs, we truly focus on empowering people to choose to live how they want as they age using disruptive innovation. So bottom line, we're on the hunt for some of the best and brightest startups, both domestically and internationally, that tackle big health tech and fintech issues. We do this work with startups. We find these startups at pitch competitions that we support across the country, accelerators that we have relationships with from Mass Challenge to Upward Labs, and then also challenges that we host as well. We have a dynamic team that serves first as the front door to startups. That's what our programming team does. Our engagement team really finds ways for us to engage with startups on a deeper level. And then we have an investment arm as well, which we've been very proud of that this year was the first year that we started writing checks within AARP Innovation Labs in March in a time when we knew that startups needed it the most. And so we're really proud that over the years of navigating, you know, a, a, um, a very a seasoned and accomplished organization like AARP, but we're still being nimble, we're still being flexible, we're still finding ways to make sure that we add value to the lives of startups. So enough about that. If you want to know more about what we're working on, you can connect with us on social. We're pretty active on social. And shout out to Jessica Wynn, who I know is here, who manages our social channels. We can be reached on Instagram and also on Twitter at AARP iLabs. We have a big event called our Grand Pitch Finale coming up on October 8th. And if you want an invitation, if you want to get on the list, make sure that you connect with us on social. All right, so let's do it, ladies. I know you're ready to talk because my mouth is ready to take a break after all that blabbering. So let's do it. First, I'll say, uh, in looking at the participant count here, if we're looking at the participant list, it's really awesome to see that there are several members of our team that are here. Like I see Christina Tamarolio, I'm sure Sheila Collins probably popped in here, Jessica Wynn, all members of the AARP Innovation Labs team. And you know, although I'll be honest in saying I don't miss the commute, that's one thing I don't ever have to deal with ever again, I do miss the energy. Right? I mean, DC Startup Week, you know, Amira, DC Startup Week is cool, virtual, but it's different. It's just a different kind of energy when we're in person. And so I will say that, you know, the energy that you get from people that you work with is something that we're probably all like, okay, can I get that back? And so let's start there. Let's start with um, just being honest about the fact that things have shifted and things have changed. But if we dig deeper, um, ladies, so if we dig deep, deeper, Corinne, Tiffany, and Olivia, and we really think about what are the mistakes, right? Because I, I like to just rip the Band-Aid off right up front and just say, what are the things that companies are really going left on when they should go right? And so let's, let's start there. Corinne, with you first. If we're being honest about where companies are making mistakes at in this new virtual world and trying to make sure that they're cultivating a good culture or just you know defining what their culture is, where do you see the mistakes being made, Corinne? Yeah, so hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, so... I think where I want to start today is, look, we're on Zoom right now, right? But I want to remind everybody, one of the biggest mistakes we made at the start was just because you can Zoom, it doesn't mean you should Zoom or that you need to Zoom. 
Um, giving your team the space to choose how they want to communicate, whether it be on screen, off screen, um, on Zoom with your cameras off so that you can collaborate more easily. Can you do a phone call? You know, even decreasing screen time by just a little bit, especially when we're relying on our screens to get all of this work done, is something that I've really been encouraging the team to do. Um, and another mistake that we made right at the start was, you know, travel has stopped, right? Business travel has stopped. A lot of personal travel has been delayed. And for many individuals who are working from home, the idea of PTO when you are staying at home doing social distance is completely foreign. So one mistake we made is forgetting to really encourage our employees to take their PTO and take some time just away from their screens within their homes, focusing on other priorities and connections that they can make. So I guess that that mistake was not really helping our employees design what they wanted. And we've really moved into a phase where they can design their days and make it work for them. So that's one of the biggest mistakes that, that we've seen. Absolutely. So Tiffany, I'm going to want to hear from you next. So what that made me think about, Corinne, is I asked someone recently, I was getting ready to jump on a, a call and I said, hey, do you want to, you want to, how do you want to do this? Like you want to do an old school phone call or do you want to Zoom? And they were just like, let's just save our facial energy for another time, right? Zoom has become like the default, right? You're just like automatically, let's get on camera. I have a whole bag over here with lipstick and a brush and some edge control to like quickly get in order if somebody wants to Zoom. But a good old fashioned phone call still works too. All right, so Tiffany, what do you think? What are some mistakes that you've seen? Um, first of all, Jacqueline, I love that you have your bag. <laughs> that is, I'm gonna actually probably have to steal that idea. <laughs> That's <laughs> really awesome. Um, so some of the mistakes that I've seen um, working with clients is uh, one, like I, I say it's, it's the, the mistake of trying too hard. So if, um, if let's say like you know right now we're in this 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 pandemic and you all want to stay connected and okay let's do the virtual happy hours like everybody's you know doing those and those are really awesome but if that's something that you all didn't do before or establish or kind of had a thing going before all of this then it's going to be really forced and really kind of awkward to just you know even do it over zoom um so i i think that um, making sure that you just don't don't force something. I'm um, kind of like what Corinne was saying, you know, like we don't want to just, you know, over Zoom and, and keep just doing Zoom just to do them. And also sometimes um, we, uh, uh, people will put this pressure on their employees to kind of um, feel like they have to stay um, where if you want to be active or green, you know, online. Um, so, I've heard from a lot of employees where they feel the pressure, like if their mouse isn't moving or if they're not at their computer all the time, then they just get this pressure. Um, and, you know, we all know, like, let's be real, we all have a lot of things going on. So whether you have kids and you are um, there with, you know, the virtual learning with them, helping them, you have to make lunch or take them to lunch or, you know, whatever the case is, like we're juggling a whole bunch of different things. So I think it's really important for, um, for companies to really just keep that in mind as well. Um, and not, not to put that pressure on, um, you know, on your employees to always have to be glued to their, um, their computer. Yeah. And I, yeah. Olivia, I'm going to want to hear from you next. It's interesting because as much as we um, have a little bit more, I guess we think we have a little bit more time. The reality is, I'm not sure if anyone else resonates with this, by four o'clock, I am spent. Like I am just absolutely drained. And to your point, Tiffany, when you think about things like trying to almost fake it, our team does this periodic um, meetup called Coffee and Carbs on Friday. It's like, okay, it's been a long week at three o'clock on Friday, get your coffee, get your carbs. But that's something we would have done in the office anyway. And so I could see what you're saying. If it's just like, hey, everyone, grab some shots and let's do it. Like we wouldn't, we wouldn't drink together normally. So why are we, why are we doing this? And so Tiffany, I, I really appreciate that perspective. Olivia, I'd love to hear your perspective too. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And I just would love to echo Corinne and Tiffany's points that not forcing things. Um, and, and that's a lot of my learnings, I think, in this time we made the mistake of creating processes for our remote community and our remote team rather than with them. Um, and I think that co-creation process is really important. Corinne mentioned something about designing your day. 
I think similarly, we should be co-creating and designing our processes that we operate within in this new remote world. Um, we were not fully remote before at GNI. We had some remote employees, but I think now that the whole team is remote after a lot of trial and error, we just learned that we shouldn't be making these definitive decisions without having a pulse on what our community leaders need, what our internal team needs. Um, and with that, there's a lot of that co-creation, collaboration. Um, so if I've learned anything from this time, or rather reaffirmed an existing belief of mine, it's that listening to those who your decisions impact is the most important part of making those decisions. Um, and setting expectations and consistent boundaries along the way too. Um, I think sometimes having one big question, like what do you want your remote day to look like is rather daunting and that's a hard way for people to weigh in. Um, so having very specific options to employees, would you prefer this kind of policy or this kind of policy and gauge where people lean? Um, Cause sometimes those decisions are so wide open, employees don't know which way they would prefer. Um, so I think setting those expectations and options to weigh in is really important. Absolutely. As you were talking, Olivia, I was thinking about design thinking, just human-centered design, keeping the human at the center of what we do. We preach all this stuff in the startup world about you know making sure you're keeping the human at the center, where in this case, the employee is the human. So you would hope someone ask, would ask you, what do you want? You know, how does this, you know, how does this work for you? So thank you for that. You know, it's been interesting seeing how large companies have repositioned or adjusted or offered certain things to make sure that employees can be effective at home. You know, you probably can all um, think about an organization that has perhaps given out some credit so people could get better um, office equipment, more ergonomically dynamic chairs, et cetera. And so for you, you know, in the vein of that thinking, tell me or think about this, what are some practices that you believe organizations should consider when trying to adapt their culture to support remote work? Like what are those things that you're just like, man, that would be really helpful if a company just considered this practice or this procedure. And Tiffany, I would love to hear from you first. Yeah, so I, you know, I'm going to kind of echo what Olivia was just saying, um, you know, in a little bit, but I, I really feel like um, when it comes to figuring out the practices, first of all, see what practices you all had in the office, like when you all, when we were all together, see what can shift or see what can be translated virtually. Um, some things maybe can, maybe certain um, meeting times can still work for everyone, you know, things like that. You know, maybe those happy hours can work, maybe the lunches can work, you know, see if, if that can shift. Um, if it can't, I am a thorough, thorough believer in, right, surveying and checking in with your employees. So seeing what their thoughts are, um, what things, you know, they're looking for, like really listening to them. Um, because while we can come up with ideas too, which is great, um, which is needed sometimes, it's really important to, to take a pulse, a pulse check and listen in um, to what your employees are, are what they're needing. Um, and I, you know, I say like, that's why you hire them because they have really amazing ideas. So this will be a great time to, um, to, to bring them in and to really, um, you know, make them feel like they are that that they are contributing to the culture and, and the shift that's happening. So awesome. Thank you, Tiffany. I think listening is super important. And as much as as much as many of us get surveys and we're just like, eh, you know, maybe I'll fill it out. Maybe I won't. Like now, as I think one of our biggest roles on the other side, if you are in a team member, is to fill out that survey so that uh, the people who um, support us from a leadership standpoint know what we're thinking and know what our requests and our wants are. Olivia, I would love to to hear your way in here. Yeah, I mean, definitely want to hammer home Tiffany's point. I think there is no one size fits model, one size all fits model. <laughs> um, you have to meet your team where they are. Um, at, so as a tools kind of angle on this, at GNI, each team member um, from our founders to our interns completes a guide to working with me. Um, and I can share this as one of my recommendations, but um, there's this great site called Liz and Molly. Um, and this template basically outlines your 
communication preferences. Um, like what irritates me? How do I like to receive feedback? How do I like to give feedback? And we did this initially before we were remote. And then we realized a lot of our answers changed while we were remote. Um, so when you ask what kinds of practices that organizations could consider, I think really defining what those communication preferences are um, and being super transparent upfront across the board about those preferences one of my direct reports might prefer one way of communication and the other might prefer an entirely different way. Um, and I feel that often remote employees may feel like disconnected or out of the loop and now we're all maybe out of the loop. Um, so that guide really ensures that those pain points are identified and addressed up front. Um, and then I know we've talked a lot about like virtual happy hours and stuff. And I think something that Tiffany said really resonated with me is that you have to identify what your community culture looks like up front. Like, what are the practices that are, we're doing now? Um, you don't have to recreate those virtually, but like, how can you translate the unique things to your team culture online um, or virtually? And something that we've done, which I've loved, we had a monthly team lunch um, and we were like, okay, so instead of getting a pizza and sharing it all around the same table, we will Venmo. Uh, folks a few dollars for their respective lunches um, and it's been really fun sometimes videos are on sometimes we are eating alone and then we're all like I ordered it from this pizza place and it's nice to have that shared experience because I think shared experience is so important to community culture and team culture yeah you know what I think is interesting in addition to what you just said Olivia is where we will meet on the happy medium and when I say that, I mean that I think a lot of times when we fill out surveys and then the end result isn't what we wanted it to be, we almost feel like someone wasn't listening to us, but it's not really true, right? It's that we aren't, we don't occupy the world alone. And so how do we come to this happy medium between, you know, what you want and need to be successful and also, you know, what the organization needs, the organization that we serve or the mission that we serve. And so I do look forward to continue best practices around that happy medium, give and take, right? I can't all, if, if the world opens back up as much as I, I love working from home, you know, I'll have to pivot and shift and how do we come to a, a happy consensus on that? So I'm curious about that in the, in the near future. Corinne, I would love your way in here. For sure. Um, you know, what, what's worked well for SeatSpot is that we have leveraged some of our existing technology tools to build culture. So we've got Slack, right? Slack. We all know, know, hate, love, it's a thing, right? Um, but what we've created on Slack is um, a hashtag real life channel. And what that gives individuals the opportunity to do is share what they're having for lunch. Like pizza pictures are a very normal thing that come through on our real life channel. Um, pictures of their fur babies, pictures of their human babies, funny interactions that they've had via email, um, pictures from their out of office time. And that just allows us to get glimpses outside of what we just see in our little Zoom frame um, and allows employees to bond and kind of see the personality. Um, and then we've also leveraged a couple remote tools that I'd highly recommend. Um, one is Rippling. It allows for remote employee onboarding and technology setup. And it also automates birthday and anniversary announcements for the team. So the team can see those things coming and plan little things to get the team excited about celebrating a certain person. And then at our all team scrums, we tend to like surprise them with for example, Kate's birthday was on Friday and she's obsessed with wine. So we all designed a little wine label that described her and what she meant to us. And we got to learn a lot about wine in the process, which was super fun. Um, and then the last thing I'll add really quickly, onboarding has been a game changer for us at SeedSpot. So if, we've, if you've hired anyone during this remote time, make sure that they're getting one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with team members and make sure within the first couple days they're seeing your work in action. So for us at SeedSpot, that meant them meeting an entrepreneur or seeing someone pitch, um, really seeing the impact of your work so they can tie their heart and their meaning to that is incredible for building that culture and that shared experience. And then one recommendation I'd have also is if you've got a couple senior employees who maybe have been on the team for five or more years that haven't worked remotely, do an onboarding for them. Pretend they're a new employee and talk through how these different systems work. I think a lot of the times we assume everybody's kind of coming into this knowing how to turn video off or to turn Zoom off. Meet people where they're at, like just like our, our my co-panelist said earlier, um, and kind of design that experience for them and make sure that they feel welcomed into this new chapter of work. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Corinne. In the spirit of the words that all of us who have any connection with um, innovation and startup world, we're going to lean all the way into our words. I know that you all hear nimble and flexible and agile, right? And all those words that now we're having to like eat what we said because we've been preaching it and now we have to do it. Everybody pop open your chat box and let's just do a group exercise together. You weren't ready for it. I didn't tell you about it, but we're going to do it. All right. So open up your chat box and let's just get, let's just see a consensus on two quick questions. The first question is, uh, what have you loved? What has been just the thing that you loved about remote work that you just do not want to change? What is the thing that you've loved about working remotely that you absolutely don't want to see change. And if you want to start thinking ahead about what the other question will be, it has been, is going to be, what is it just like, oh no, I, I really don't love that. So let's go ahead and get our first round of stuff. Wow. You, okay. You're in here. You've loved no commuting. Me too. Proximity to my fridge. That's funny. The time I get to spend with my three-year-old, easier to work out. Mar Marcus or Marquise Terry, no commute. I love that. Family lunch is awesome. I get a chance to go upstairs and have lunch with my husband and that's great. Lunchtime workouts, Nolan, that's dope. Creative and innovative ways in which to accomplish tasks. Thanks, ROK, working out. Toggling between different sessions and meetings and fitting in a Peloton class. Talk about super multitask in there. Sheila, I don't know if this is Sheila Collins from my team, yoga pants. That means to me it's a party down bottom and a business attire up top is what she's been doing. All right, I can do laundry while working. Yeah, unfortunately, I forget about my clothes in the washing machine sometimes, and that's never good. Okay, Zoom shirts. I don't know what that is, but I want one. Flexibility and work hours. Okay, all right, so let's go to the other end. What has been just like, oh, I really don't really enjoy this about remote work. And I can guess what these too many tempting snacks. Jessica wins on my team. Okay, Jessica. <laughs> all right, what else? What has been, oh, not like about remote work? Oh, I see. Okay, you've reiterated what I just said. Feeling removed from my team. Yep, I do miss my team. It's a bit lonely. All right, a lot of easy distractions, absolutely. What else, anyone, anything else? You need a change of environment, gotta go for a walk. It's a challenge to maintain work-life balance. Yes, you feel like at six o'clock, you're still sitting at your desk. It's isolating. Screen time is through the roof. Cross-team communication by the water cooler. You know, all that, you know, talk that you probably shouldn't be talking about near the water cooler. You missed that, I know. Every day feels the, feels the same. Okay, missing all the the interaction and sparks. Okay, all right, so just quick exercise to break us out of our, what my design thinking team would, would call rivers of thinking. And I think it's a perfect time for us to lean into our third question. And that third question is around, is around a bit of forecasting. You know, what do you think about the future? What do you think that the future holds? I know that uh, none of us here have crystal balls. Um, none of us here have the answers to everything. And if you do have that, you should be hitting the lottery up and not here on this panel right now if you got those, those answers. I really want to know, ladies, like, what do you think the future holds? If you can forecast into the future, this is what the future of remote work will look like. What do you think that will be? And, and as you're thinking about that, that question and preparing to answer, um, uh, Olivia, I'll come to you first on this. I really um, also wanted to communicate why um, the meeting or why the, the answer cadence is going the way that it is. And the reason why I say that is because typically when I moderate a panel, I usually don't ask all the panelists the same questions. But there was a reason why I intentionally did this today. First is because, number one, these women come with a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of a commitment to the space. And it was important that we got insights from each and every one of them. In addition to the fact that we have the time, when there is the time and the energy and the interest to answer all the questions and for us to be fruitful in the answers, I make sure that I allow the space for that. So that's the reason why everyone's answering the questions so you can get all the nuggets and apply them into your lives accordingly. So let's forecast a bit. Olivia, I am curious if you rub your magic crystal ball and you can say this is what the next six months or a year or two years will look like as it relates to the future of work. What is that? What do you think? Yeah, great question. I feel like as uh, someone that has a history in events, I'm used to like planning and, and knowing the plan. And I'm like, I feel like we can't plan for anything anymore. So it's a great question. I'm curious to hear everyone's um, predicaments here. But I think there's no question that more and more companies will be moving to a fully remote work um, culture, even beyond COVID and the current situation we're in, in a year's time. Um, but I think what's going to set all these different companies apart from one another is 
authenticity, transparency, and communal work cultures. Um, because now, as you said before, all the buzzwords of nimble, flexible, like everyone's going to be leaning into that, which I think is wonderful. Um, but the thing that is going to set companies apart from one another is that sense of community um, and being director of community. I, I hope that's true. Um, and that's why at G and I were trying to build with our team, and I mentioned this before, but not for them. Um, we want to know what kind of community our team resonates with, what kind of community they want to see, um, both internally and externally with our community leaders. Um, so I think also interweaving wellness into that, um, and again, that's that's more of my company in particular. I, I've, see, I've seen that over the years, a lot more companies adapting to working. I just know someone said a Peloton, like, working in their workouts and during the day and encouraging wellness integrated into the day. So I think there's no question that's going to be a huge common factor. Something I'm so excited about. Um, I think DC has an incredible talent pool, no question about that. But as we think about diversity and inclusion and not just being so city centric, I'm really thrilled to know that our talent pool when we're hiring is going to be larger. It is not just going to be a certain age group, a certain demographics, both background, financially, just residing within the city. We're going to be able to reach people in rural areas and hopefully hire folks that maybe not have applied to the role before because of accessibility. So that's really exciting to me, but I'm curious to hear from all of you too. Absolutely. Corinne, I would love to hear your predictions. Yes, plus one to everything that Olivia said. My vision is that companies are gonna design positions that will open up access to that wider talent pool, right? So diverse backgrounds, locations. Um, and then what's also interesting too is you think about individuals who don't have to worry about transportation or physical barriers that it would take for them to get to work would have access to roles. Uh, my next prediction is a little wild, so stick with me, but as I was dreaming big, we've been designing um, VR programs for entrepreneurs who need to practice pitching to large groups of audience members. We can't have audiences right now. We can't have large groups in areas. So we've been designing that program so they can put this on and pretend they've got an audience watching them. And then I thought about that as it relates to work. What if there's a day where we put on VR goggles and we sit around a boardroom with our coworkers? I know that's a little crazy and a little bit out there, but as far as feeling in the same room as somebody, I guarantee you that individuals are gonna to start to kind of experiment with what that looks like as sort of a different type of screen. Um, my third vision is that I really hope that we are going to be in that same human-centered design way, designing the technology tools and the support for individuals with differing abilities to be able to participate. So thinking about the advancements in closed captioning, I'm thinking about the advancements with visual aids for different opportunities. Um, there are barriers that are presented with our existing technology. So I am so excited as those continue to develop to make sure that we're being inclusive. Um, and then my last vision is that internship opportunities are going to explode with remote opportunities, creating a really great pipeline of people who are ready to be a part of virtual and remote life and get excited about it and seek out jobs that have that competitive edge. Um, about 80% of employees, Gallup just did a poll in April, 80% of future employees are looking for remote or flexible opportunities. So designing internships with that in mind is something that I'm looking forward to in the future as well. Great. Thank you, Corinne. And Tiffany, we would love to hear your predictions to, to close out the formal part of our conversation today. Okay. I just love how we're just all on the same page because I just agree with everything that Corinne and Olivia that you all are saying. So um, I, I, I will probably just have one more thing to add. Um, right. Remote work. This is nothing new. It wasn't new prior to so all of this happening. Um, so there were a lot of companies and organizations that had already adopted it, but there were a lot that were really just, you know, kind of not ready to, to move forward with it. And it's interesting because literally at the beginning of March, so like the first week of March, I, um, I was meeting with someone and kind of talking with them about, you know, uh, introducing remote work with their organization. And they were just like, mm, I don't know. And I'm like, it can be done. And sure enough, what, two, three weeks later, it, you know, it, it had to be done. So um, 
uh, I guess my crystal ball does work. Uh, so in that instance, it did. Um, but I, I think I would say um, because this is going to be the norm now. So I think by the time this time next year, right, we're going to see a significant increase in the, um, in the normalcy of remote work. I feel that employers are going to have to um, find other uh, benefits or perks. So it used to be like, right, remote work was, oh, this was a perk, this is a benefit. Hey, you can do this once a week or twice a week. But now that this is the norm, um, employers are gonna have to find more creative ways and more benefits to attract, um, to attract people um, so this is because, yeah, this is just going to be an, an everyday thing now. So it's going to really um, force us to have to think outside of the box, which is great, um, and into finding more ways to, to get more people. And especially, you know, uh, with the Gen Z, I mean, this is, we really have to be creative and, um, and, and getting them um, to work with us and work for us um, as they're going to be leading all of this, you know, this remote work. So, absolutely. Well, thank you to each of you for your predictions. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to place some bets on those predictions. I don't know. Drop it in the chat, I suppose. <laughs> right, Corinne. <laughs> All right. So we're going to get ready to go into Q and A. So, audience, it is your time to shine. But before I say that, I just wanted to say a couple things that really were manifesting in my mind as you all were giving your predictions. I was talking earlier about uh, what we all remember to be. Uh, nonprofit and um, even just fundraising dinners, right? There was a practice not so long ago, earlier this year, where we all got together around fundraising events and normally it involved food, some formal meal of some sort, right? And most of us went, maybe because you paid for a ticket or your friend begged you to come or you went on behalf of your company and you sometimes sat there miserable, like, okay, another chicken dinner, right? Another wasted evening. And I mean, all, all with good intentions of whatever the organization is. But it's interesting because now we're forced into changing that. We can't sit around over another rubber chicken dinner. We can't practice or do what we've been doing time and time again. And so I was thinking about how much many of us are clamoring to get back to normal. But instead, let's sit in this moment for a second and recognize like what's in the win column? What is working? Where are we saving dollars? Where can we absolutely just embrace where we're at right now and figure out a way to make this work? And then the other thing I was thinking about, I mentioned pitch competitions that we engage in over at AARP Innovation Labs. The reality is typically our pitch competitions are regionally based. So we go to Nashville and we go to Silicon Valley and we go to Vegas to do these pitch events. And what happens? We expect that startups are gonna fly out there and they're gonna take part in this. But by us switching to a virtual model, I can't say one that's gonna be like this forever, but by us embracing this new virtual model, really it lowers the barrier to entry because you could be in, I don't know, Montana and participate in a FinTech pitch event that would normally happen in New York. And if you're a nimble startup, then you couldn't have made it. And so it's, it's really time for us to really just make a T, put W and put you know C on the other side. What are the wins? What are the challenges that we've, that we've truly accumulated as a result of COVID, specifically in the workplace, and what do we want to keep, and what do we what do we just feel like we want to throw out, okay? So with that, let's do this. Let's go ahead and get into some questions. Amira, I know you're going to pop back on audio-wise, and we're going to talk through some questions that people have. I see one from Nolan. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. um, so first of all, thank you. So insightful. Um, so insightful. So many different perspectives from my own. I mean, I, I am um, someone who was so dying to get back to the office or to get back to in person, to leaving, to get out of my home. Um, so I think I'm one of the few people who actually got an office during this time. <laughs> As the market is dying, the real estate market is dying, I decided to give it a little bit of investment. Um, so yeah, let's get, let's get Nolan's question answered. And then um, team, everyone on the call, we'd love to hear your thoughts, your questions. Um, and if you don't ask questions, we might actually turn this around and start asking you questions. So, um, so Nolan's question is, as remote work becomes more normalized, how do we address jobs and employees that can't be virtual? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, anyone want to take that? Olivia, I saw you unmute real fast. <laughs> <laughs> I was just preparing to oh, okay. over here. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to kick it off. I mean, I 
I think that's a great question. And I, I would love to dig into it a little bit more as in like, why can't these employees be virtual? I think one, if it's resources, that's something that I hope companies are providing equipment so people can be virtual. But if it's more of a time energy, you know, typical within the typical work day, I think the answer to that is we, they can't be virtual within our current structure. So that's actually not our problem. That, that's not the employee's problem, that's our problem. Um, and I think that's what we would need to change. So if this employee couldn't be virtual within the typical nine to five, let's say those hours are, um, you know, what does it look like to switch that around? Ooh, I just switched my computer, sorry. <laughs> um, what does it look like to switch that around? And, you know, if they can't make a team meeting or something, are those team meetings recorded? How can we share that information asynchronously? Um, and if it's a time zone thing, I know Corinne's worked in different time zones. We actually, in the beginning of COVID, had our intern move back to India. She was a student in DC. And that was my first time being like truly different time zones. Um, and we were working like day and night. And I think that was something that we didn't want to be her problem. We wanted to take that on and be like, okay, how can we address this for her? Like what are actually the boundaries here? So um, I don't know if that's actually a, a concrete answer, but I think the answer is, is that like, we need to break down the current structures to make that possible um, and kind of look at it as more solution oriented. While, while the rest of you are, are thinking up your, your questions, because I know there are some other questions here, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat box. Um, Corinne, Tiffany, any other insight here? If not, then I, I have a, a burning question that um, I would love to ask you to, to either, either three of you. Just plus one to what Olivia said. And okay. My recommendation for working across time zones, if that is one of the barriers, um, we have individuals on the East Coast and West Coast currently, and sometimes internationally, we pick a couple hours a day that are those peak communication times. Mm -hmm. That means that we've got, we schedule our meetings in that time and everyone is on Slack to be able to get questions answered quickly. Outside of that, create the flexibility that works. So agreed, pick out those barriers and then work with your team to um, create solutions with them that work for them. Gotcha. And I would just add really quickly um, for those employees or those people who who absolutely have to be in the office. Um, I just think it's really important and this may just be a personal thing. I just think it's really important to um, make sure that um, that we're providing um, our staff and employees with just, you know, with PPE and making sure that they feel as safe as possible. There is a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry going on amongst, you know, all of us with all this stuff going on. But I think just trying to make sure that the office space is as um, safe as it can be, as comfortable as it can be, and taking time out to speak with those employees, because in case there are some that are in the office and then some that aren't, you know, there may be some resentment. Like, I mean, it could be a whole bunch of different, you know, feelings and emotions going on. So just really taking the time to, to have you know, um, a good consistent communicate line of communication going and just making them feel safe as, as much as you can. One question that I'm wondering as, as our audience is, is still um, thinking about their questions and preparing to drop them in the chat box is something that's a little bit more uh, shallow, if you will, and surfacey, but very real because we all have to do it and that's clothing. And so I, I know that you've seen the gamut being run um, in terms of what people are wearing in front of a digital screen. Do you think that it, it should matter as much? Do you think that um, it, you know, there should be some, some form of dress code? And a, a part of this question is a little bit self-serving because I teach modern etiquette internationally. And so I'm always curious about what are the norms and protocols and how are they changing? And, but since I have the experts here, let me just do this. What do you think? Do you think that there should be some type of guidelines around, okay, professional dress is in a virtual work environment? Would love to hear. Tiffany, any insight there? Um, so I would say this, and, and, and I'm, I'm a little different, but I definitely, there, I'm okay with a, uh, with a casual dress environment. I mean, especially since we are home, um, I, I just, 
you need to be comfortable. Like, I just feel like that's one less thing to have to worry about. We already have, you know, work and all these other things that are on our minds. And um, I just think as long as everything is just tasteful. So, you know, you know, as long as your shirt or whatever you have on is, you know, relatively clean and, you know, nothing crazy written on there or whatever. And as long as you're just, you know, covered up and stuff, I think it's fine. Um, I mean, we're kind of all like we're halfway doing it anyway. So, uh, you know, I, like I think Amira said earlier, like this, like the party on the bottom and, you know, professional on top. So, you know, just be tasteful, but be comfortable. Yeah. And I, just so we're clear here, because I'm sure the audience is looking at my get up today and thinking she has ulterior motives. She has a whole blazer and a professional necklace. Listen, this is not an indication of how I wanted the answers to go. I've just had a busy day where I had to dress like this, but normally I would have on a t-shirt and a hoodie or something like that. Okay. So I'm really just curious. Corinne, it looks like you had unmuted. Sure, I can jump in. Um, we, we experimented with this and what we ended up um, updating our employee directions is for an internal and an external. Um, so for external meetings with any donors or external stakeholders, um, here is what can be expected. And then for internal, here's what can be expected. And then what we also did is we appointed a person on the team that you could ask your questions to. I mean, if you were had a question about if something was appropriate, you could just go to that person, no questions asked, nothing embarrassing could happen. And then my advice to everybody is when you are designing these policies, please make sure that they're gender neutral. You're not saying people who identify as women can wear this, people who identify as men can wear this. Make sure that your policies are flexible and all encompassing so that no matter the person that is showing up to work, they can feel comfortable and not that they have to wear a certain thing because of a certain thing just because they're on camera. So that was a, that was a good lesson learned from us. Gotcha. Awesome. And let's go ahead and round this out. Any, um, any, any other advice that you have, um, Olivia, to, to round this out as it relates to dress? Just going to say, if you've read uh, Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, she has up and down days. And that's kind of what GNI has established. We have our meeting days where we're like a little more on with our outfits, but then we have basically team-wide off or down days where it's really like whatever goes. And I think that has worked for us um, because it doesn't feel like every day you have to be presentable. Like I am totally bunning it in my sweatpants sometimes. And that's nice to have that option to kind of turn it off some days. Understood. Amira, that's a great question. You, you want to answer, answer, ask your question, Amira? Yes. And I actually I wanted to answer the question that you oh, asked because I think it's so amazing. Um, you know, one thing I think people, uh, we've discovered about people in this time and about ourselves is we don't always know what's best for us and we don't always do what's best for us. And so when it comes to what we wear, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, my, I, I was in quite a state and my, and I live alone and my family, most of my family, at least my parents live overseas. And my mom would call all the time and she would say, what are you wearing? And she would tell me, especially in the first few days, you know, when, when things were super crazy and uncertain, she would say, get dressed, wear a shirt you love, wear nice earrings, put on some makeup, and you'll feel better. And I think one thing that's really helpful when we think about remote work and our people and our teams and how we lead them is to actually not necessarily always put policies in place, but to offer ways that people can feel better. Like this has worked for me. I don't know if it will work for you, but this has worked for me and this makes me feel better. And I think, you know, there's this really, um, there's a song, I can't remember the, the singer, but it's, it's called Look Good For You. It's a really funny song. I don't know if you've heard it, but look it up. And, and, and the singer is saying, look good for you. Um, and, you know, go out and get that, whatever that, the sweatpants are that make you feel really good or, you know, the, the shade of uh, blush or the sneakers or the polo, whatever it is that makes you feel good will help you be more productive um, and, and help you feel um, more accomplished in your work. So, so ju that's a, just a different spin on that question. I, I actually think that's a great thing. And I think too, the reality is if we're all being honest, when you look good, you feel better. 
Like you just like, okay, I, you know, like this Saturday, I'm going to get my eyebrows done for the first time. Listen, it is like Christmas. You know, you just, you, you just feel better when you look good. I put on heels recently and I was just like, oh, I actually miss heels. I mean, you have to break your feet back in again, but it feels good. And I think the other thing that I was just thinking of as you were talking, um, Amira, was about, um, about a little bit of knowing your team. Like they're, you know, I work with dynamic people on my team. My, my team are, they're rock stars and I love working with them each and every day. And to pay attention when things are different, right? To pay attention when some, someone's attitude has changed or someone has been saying, hey, you know, I've been feeling a little bit different. And to ask, like, how you doing? Do you need anything? To actually like ramp your empathy up right now is a huge benefit, not only, you know, for the organization, if that's the lens that you look through, but just for humankind, period. And so I've, you know, been a lot more empathetic and just listening to my team. How are you doing? Are you okay? Do you need anything? Because right now, um, that's just what we all need. So I see that there is another question. We have about eight minutes left. So if anyone has any other questions, um, we have a couple minutes for them. But the question here um, that uh, Amira put in the chat is, how do you create space for people to breathe in this crazy remote work environment? We hear that most people are in back-to-back -back meetings most days. And so how, how should people really create just that space to just be? And um, Corinne, I, I think that you probably have some insight here. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, What's challenging is that sometimes when we close our work laptops, we are immediately suffocated with other, with other things. I'm in Oregon right now, right? We can't go outside, we can't open the windows because our air quality is in the 600s. Mm -hmm. So really being present with what your employees are going through and, and checking in too, like if, if something does seem off, hey, how can we be there for you? Help them reimagine their schedules, help give them the grace to and let them give you grace when you need it too. But, but to reimagine what that looks like, you know, if somebody needs to take off early to pick up their kid or to do a lesson with their kid, totally fine. And have your team be ready to back one another up. And the understanding mutually across our team is that everyone has needed it over the past few months and everyone is going to need it. So do not be afraid to ask for what you need as an employee from your leaders because good leaders will be there to make sure that happens for you. Great. And Tiffany, um, any insight here on that from you? Um, nothing really additional. Okay, no worries. Additionally, I mean, Corinne said it perfectly, like as far as like giving grace. Um, I think maybe if I, if I did have to say something, um, as far as just, just for yourself, like I know for me, what I have to do, I have to write, I have to really be intentional about setting that, that time. Um, so what I do, even if I, if I can't get out the house or can't go away, I try to go to another room and I try to do just do some meditation so I'll listen to like guided meditation I use like the calm app and sometimes just taking like two minutes or five minutes just a little breaks in my day makes a huge huge difference um so because I know sometimes we can't always depend on you know our leadership to kind of like check in with us because I know they're busy too but I think if you also just take some um some you know, to just, just time for yourself and just be mindful, you know, when you can. Absolutely. Olivia, I'm going to throw it to you for, to round it out and make sure that we're being fair and inclusive. And then I'm going to kick it back to Amira to close us out for today. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, that's, that's a tough act to follow for the last comment of the day, but I will say that something we're trying actually tomorrow, the first day we're trying it is, uh, called breaks giving. And it's an initiative that Etsy started uh, during this wild time that we're all living in. And it is company-wide days off for no apparent reason. Um, and we've found that people are more stressed to take PTO. I know we talked about this, but it's so much better when you know nothing's happening without you. Like the entire company has stopped. Um, so we are having our first Breaksgiving tomorrow and we're having five more throughout the quarter and we'll see where that ends up. But I think knowing that Corinne mentioned like closing your laptop, like knowing that a lot of our team members have not been able to do that as well as they have when they were physically working, walking away from the office. We felt that this time really everyone's working overtime in some capacity or another. We've all earned this time and I think it's gonna be a great way for us to collectively take a breather. Um, and also be re-energized more. I think similarly to what Amira said, when you look good, you're working better, but also when you're taking actual breaks, you're working better too. So it'll hopefully be a positive thing for our team, but 
Um, I love the ideas too of designing your own schedule, but hopefully we'll, we'll be uh, having more breaks givings in the future as well. Thank you. Well, thank you ladies for your insight, your expertise. I'm looking forward to what the future holds for each and every one of you. It's been an honor moderating today and I'm going to turn it back over to Amira to close us out. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a remarkable session. We've learned so much from all of you. Uh, I'm so grateful that you all said yes to joining um, the first ever culture track at DC Startup Week. You're each brilliant in your own right. Um, so many practical ideas shared. Um, so really quickly, we have an amazing session coming up in three minutes actually on um, going from self-care to team care, how we prioritize mental health in the workplace, especially in a time of crisis. Um, what can we learn and how can we take care of ourselves and our teams right now? Um, so please feel free to join us for that. I think it's going to be an amazing session. And then tomorrow is our last session for the culture track at 10 a.m. I'll be moderating a really amazing panel on um, the CEO's new framework on employee engagement, retention, and culture. And for those of you who do want um, all the recommendations and resources provided by our speakers, as well as the full recap, um, please go ahead and download at manifesta.co slash startup week. We are um, so thrilled that you were able to join us. Thank you, Jacqueline, Olivia, Tiffany, and Corinne. You are amazing. Um, have a wonderful day, everybody. <laughs>